Just help us to read through Daniel's words and allow him to maybe confront us a little bit. Allow him to maybe challenge us a little bit with his prayer. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would search the deep recesses of our soul, that you would explore those nooks and crannies that we often hide from other people, that we try to hide from you, and that, Lord, we we trick ourselves into thinking aren't there. So, God, we just pray that you would lay our hearts open, that you would examine us today, and that you would see if there's any, any wicked way within us, and, Lord, transform us. God, we truly want to see a transformation of our culture. Lord, we want to see our country, our state, our city, the world all come back to you, Lord, and have a deep fervor for loving you and spreading your word. But Lord, that won't happen unless your people allow you to examine them and to say, God, will you transform us to be what you've called us to be? So Lord, I pray that you would be with me as we journey through this text, that Lord, you would give me um, the strength and the ability and the wisdom to preach through this text, and that, Lord, you would lead us through it, and that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's read Daniel 9 first. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last seventy years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all those who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O Lord, we and our kings, our princes, our fathers are covered with the with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning away from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away from your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. And we'll pick up with uh, the rest of it next week. We'll split nine into two sections. The book of Daniel follows the events of God's people being taken into a strange and foreign land that's often hostile to them. And the land of Babylon offers no shortages of trials for the Israelites. Their worship, their loyalty to God, their character, even their very eating habits are constantly scrutinized. And in some cases, those habits and lifestyles are used to try to kill the people of Israel. But the one question that we haven't really looked at so far in the book of Daniel is this. Why are they in Babylon in the first place? If this place seems so bad, why is everybody there? So what we want to do today is we want to look at Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to look at some of the context that kind of sets up this chapter. 
Then we're going to look at Daniel's prayer, which is going to give us three things. It's going to give us a confession, the consequences of sin, and a call for mercy. And then there'll be another part that we'll look at next week with the Lord's response to the prayer. So the context that's behind this prayer is hundreds of years before Daniel in the lion's den, hundreds of years before the fiery furnace, or hundreds of years before this huge statue of Nebuchadnezzar, there was an old man and an old woman who lived in the middle of nowhere and had, they, they had no children. And God came to this old couple and he said, if you follow me, I will give you a future. And so this old couple followed him across the ancient Near East to a land they'd never been to before, hundreds of miles away from their family and their home. And God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you land and I'm going to give you descendants. And so that old couple, against all hope, they have a child. And that child has two children. And that one of those kids has 12 children. Those 12 children have so many descendants that within a few hundred years, they are in the two millions by some estimations. And so these descendants of this old man and this old woman, the people of Israel, live in Egypt for a period of time. And things kind of seem okay at first, but they have some political changes and the government changes a little bit. And the king of Egypt decides that he is scared to death of the people of Israel because what if they rebel? And so he decides to crush their morale by working them constantly. No breaks. You work until you die. And to make things even worse, he, begin, he begins a genocide campaign that if you ever see a Hebrew baby or a Hebrew child that's male two years and younger, peanut butter to the throat. And so the people of Israel cry out, we need help, we need rescued from what we're going through. And God rescues them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and brings them out of Egypt. And before he takes them to the promised land, they have kind of a side trip to Mount Sinai, where God reveals himself to them very powerfully and speaks to them and draws them into a covenant. Well, what is a covenant? Basically, a covenant is when you have two groups, a lesser, or a, I'm sorry, a greater and a lesser, and both of those groups are going to pledge themselves to each other. All right, there'll be promises made. So in the covenant, the Lord says to Israel, I will be your God, you will be my people, I will watch over you, I will protect you from your enemy, I will bless your children, I will bless your land. And basically, within this country of Israel, things are going to go well for you. Okay, that sounds good. For the Israelites, they are called to do a handful of things. One, they are to show covenant loyalty to God. No other gods, no other kings. They are to offer sacrifices to the Lord just to say, God, you've given us this. We want to give it back to you. Thank you. If the Lord declares war against those who have risen up against him, the people of Israel are to be his tools and utensils for battle. And they are to keep God's law and follow it faithfully because the Lord looks at it this way. If you follow my law, that shows me that you love me. And if you love me, you'll follow my law. Terms of the covenant. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, you're going to see the blessings of the covenant. So if Israel does these things in that time frame, living in the land of Israel, God will do specific things for them. If they turn against God, there are consequences to that. And spoiler alert, there's like twice as many consequences as there are blessings. So there's very serious about this covenant. But in Deuteronomy 28 verse 64 um, through 68, you kind of get a feel for the, the biggest um, the biggest consequence for breaking the covenant. And we'll just read the first verse of that. So Deuteronomy 28. Then the Lord will scatter you among all nations, from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. So basically the blessings, or the, the curses kind of climax with God scattering his people all over the world. And so that's what we see in the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel realizes we've been scattered because of this, and he's reading the book of Jeremiah, which is interesting because you typically don't have other Bible books talk about other Bible books. This is one of the times it does. So Daniel is reading Jeremiah, and specifically in Jeremiah 25 and 29, it says that the time frame for this exile is going to be about 70 years. And so Daniel's kind of figuring out his math. He's much better at math on the spot than I am, I suppose. And um, Daniel is taken into exile in the year 605 BC. And the time that D Daniel 9 starts is 538 BC. 
So if you do the math, that's about 68 years have gone by. So if this time frame is supposed to be 70 years, and we're in year 68 of that, it's about time to maybe look forward to going home, which we'll talk about numbers next week when we look at the second half of chapter 9. But it's almost like Daniel realizes our time's about done. If this was court, maybe the judge would bring out the book and kind of review the case and say, okay, their sentence is about over. What are we going to do with them? Maybe the Lord's looking at our sentence and saying, okay, the 70 years is up. Has Israel changed any? And so Daniel petitions to the Lord, and it says that he wears sackcloth, he wears ashes, he fasts, um, he prays, he petitions, all signs of lamenting over sin. And so with that, Daniel offers a prayer starting in verse 4. In this prayer, we're going to see three main sections. We're going to see a confession, we're going to see the consequences of sin, and we're going to see his call for mercy. And so notice how his confession to the Lord starts out. It actually starts out with worship. He begins by telling us who God is and what he's done. So who is God and what has he done? It says, starting in verse 4, God is great. God is awesome. And then it says that God keeps his covenant with love to all who love and obey him. And we're immediately kind of slapped a little bit. Because before he even gets too far in the prayer, we realize this is the problem. God is faithful to his covenant. And not just his covenant with the people of Israel. He's been faithful to his covenant with David. He's been faithful to his covenant with Abraham. He's been faithful with his covenant to Noah. God is always faithful to his people. There's never a time when God is not faithful. And so it immediately highlights God's faithful, but the people of Israel have not been. And so as we read through this psalm, you're going to notice that worship of God is intertwined all over the place. It's not neatly at the beginning, it's intertwined throughout. And as we read through this, the praises of God continue to heap upon themselves. So I wrote a very brief short list of the praises that Daniel gives to the Lord here. He says he's great. He says he's awesome. He says he keeps his covenant of love. God is righteous. God is merciful. God is forgiving. Um, He says a second time, God is righteous. God is the one who brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. God is the one who made a name for himself that endures to this day. A third time, he says that God is righteous. God is the one who brings anger. God is the one who brings wrath. God is the one who sees, the one who hears, and he is the one who is great in mercy. So as we begin to look at God's greatness, it begins to build God up. And the next thing that Daniel does is after building up this huge picture of God, he begins to talk about Israel. And the contrast cannot be more great. That's why I said this a few weeks ago, but one of the benefits of hymns is in most hymns, that first verse is going to magnify God and show how great God's goodness is. And usually verse 2 will contrast that with the depravity of man because it's trying to highlight God's goodness, our need for God. And usually in verse 3, it shows that God is the solution through Jesus for the problem of sin. And so we might say, well, Has God tried to deal with this problem of sin before? And Daniel tells us absolutely. He says that God has spoken to us directly. Remember Mount Sinai. God brings the people of Israel there. God audibly speaks to everybody. And immediately following giving the Ten Commandments, remember what Israel says, we never want to hear his voice again. It was too scary. And God says, okay, I can understand that. And he says, I'm going to send prophets. I'll speak directly to the prophet. And the prophet will go out and talk to you. But they ignore that too. And so then God says, well, okay, I'll give you my law. I'll write it down on scroll. I'll write it down on tablet. Either way, you have my, you have my written word. And guess what they do with his written word? They ignore that too. Every single way that God has tried to speak to the Israelites, guess what they do? La, 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 I'm not listening. So we look at this and we realize God is great. God is good. Thank you for this food. No, I'm just messing with you. God is great, and in contrast, the people of Israel break his covenant time and time again. And so Daniel is led to confess for the people. And we'll talk more about we'll talk more about the specific sins they've done. But notice as he confesses, there's going to be very two very interesting things about his confession that I want to point out. The first is the thoroughness of their sin. Notice he says that the kings have sinned, the princes have sinned, the elders of Israel have sinned, but he also says the common person has sinned, So, which is a merism. We have the rich, we have the poor, and everybody in between. 
He says that the people of Jerusalem, this huge, sprawling urban city, the people of the city are sinning, but also the people that live in the countryside are sinning. So the, the city folk, the country folk, and everybody in between. The people in the southern half of Israel called Judea, the people in the northern half called Israel, and everybody in between, they're engaged in sin. So Daniel is painting this picture that sin has completely run rampant in the land of Israel. The second interesting thing to notice about his confession is his use of we. Now, this I'll be honest with you, I've never really studied Daniel until this sermon series, and I've really come to think Daniel's a cool guy. He's probably one of my favorite characters, which you might just say, Jeff, you'll say that until we get to the next series, and you'll say that, you're right, you caught me. My favorite book of the Bible is whatever we're currently studying. But anyway, Daniel's kind of a cool guy. He's bold, and he's brave, and he, he's not scared to stand up for what's right, and he's constantly worshiping the Lord, even if it's going to cost him his life. Daniel is kind of a hero in this story. And so it's interesting that when it comes to confessing the sin of Israel, he doesn't say those people, those dirty sinners. He says we. And I think there's something that we can take from his use of we into our own lives as we talk about sin. The first thing that I think we can take from this is that Daniel's use of we reminds us that we have a responsibility to be praying for people that aren't going to pray for themselves. In John Wesley's um, sermon on the Beatitudes, he talks about that Beatitude, blessed are those who mourn for they'll be comforted. And one of the ways he interprets that is that you and I have a responsibility to cry for the sins of those who won't cry for their own sin. But we have a responsibility to pray for and intercede for those who are lost. Lost people aren't just going to say, you know what, I need to be saved. I'm going to pray for them. They need somebody praying for them. We've all heard stories of moms or grandmas who pray for their, their kids or grandkids, and one day that person becomes saved, and what do they always say? I always had a grandma praying for me. I think that's what we're called to do, that we're not just called to watch and say, boy, I hope they learn their lesson. We're called to be engaged in praying for people who are lost. That idea of we're just going to sit back and watch these people sin until God destroys them, God condemns that when Jonah does that. And so that's not acceptable. We, we must be in prayer for people who are not going to pray for themselves. So I guess my question would be, are you currently praying for people that the Lord would work in their hearts? Because if we don't pray for people, I think we've failed our responsibility. Secondly, by using the word we, it keeps us from having a false sense of pride. Well, what does that mean? I had a friend, and twice a year my friend would call me, and he would say, Jeff, I need you to pray for me. And I'd be like, well, what's the matter? He said, it's time, for, it's time for either fall or spring revival, and I need you to pray for me. And I said, well, why do you need prayer? And he would say, because I don't know what to do. Okay, well, what's the problem? And he said, the reality is, when my people ask me for revival, they're not asking someone to come in and challenge them where they are. What they want is someone to come in and talk about how bad the world is and to make them feel kind of smug in their salvation. So basically, you know, those homosexuals out there, or those drunks out there, or those people out there, but you guys, we're living for God. And he said, it bothers me because they don't want to be challenged by God's word. They just want to feel secure in what they're doing, and they want us to feel bad about how evil the world is. Basically, one of these ideas, this sermon is for those people. But the reality is, by using we, it reminds us that, you know, we can't do that. We can't say, you know, boy, it's a good thing we're here. We're so good. We're so righteous. I hope that God gets those people. The we reminds us that we're in this together. We live in this world. We live in this state. We live in this city. We live in this country together. And like we talked about today in our small group class, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, we're reminded that if it wasn't for Jesus, when we turn on the news, that could be us too. I not you know I always think back to before I was a Christian I was kind of a I was kind of a schmuck back then. You might say pastor not much has changed and I would say you're probably right. But if you could meet me back then you would say at least he's not that bad. So we never want to get in this idea of us versus them. We're in this together and we need to be praying for them and working with them and ministering to them. And thirdly, the we reminds us that whether we'd like to admit it or not I think that we are more culpable in societal sin than we'd like to admit. And let me tell you a story. When I, and I'll, I'll try to do this without saying any names, so it might be a little tricky. But you might say, Pastor, you're good at being tricky. 
All right. I will say this: when they were getting, when they had all the rubber bands out, putting shoe boxes together, there was a certain thirty-six-year-old who had snuck out some rubber bands and was, instead of working to pack shoe boxes, was running through the hallways shooting rubber bands at people. So that may or may not have been me. But anyway, so. If it took 10 extra minutes, it's my fault because I wasn't working like I should. Anyway, I digress. I digress. So anyway, one of my professors in seminary was a radio personality. And he was telling us a story in the state that he lived in. One of the politicians was involved in a huge scandal, completely rocked the state. And so one of the local news channels was having all the local pastors come in to talk about this guy's sin. And they were going to comment on it. You know, how could this happen? And so during one of the commercial breaks, one of the interviewers went to my professor and said, whose fault is this? Who's to blame? And my professor was waiting for this opportunity. He had his opinion already worked out. And he said, whose fault is it? Whose fault? I'll tell you whose fault it is. And he said, before he could speak, there's this little old man standing behind both of them. And this little old man said, I know whose fault it is. And they turned around and this, this little old pastor. You could even call him Pastor Nobody. That wasn't his name. I'm just being, you know what I mean, though. So anyway, they turn around and they look. How could it be this old pastor's fault? And he said, let me explain. He said, for someone in our community to believe that they can do something this heinous and get away with it, I have failed to teach people what the gospel teaches. And he said, it's my fault. And that's a very interesting way because I know when we turn on the news, When we read these papers, when we get on the internet, and we read these stories, and we say, how in the world can society get this bad? It's the parents' fault. It's the school's fault for not having prayer. It's the government's fault. But at the end of the day, the government is not commanded to preach the gospel. Our school system is not commanded to preach the gospel. Jesus, at the end of his life, takes the people who have committed their lives to him as disciples, and he says, you guys... I need you guys to go out and make disciples. No one else is going to do it. It's you guys. And as you make disciples, those disciples will make new disciples, and those people will make disciples. So when I look at these news stories, my question is, why hasn't the church taught these people? Why isn't the church invested in families to keep them together? Why hasn't the church invested in these or in this or this? Whether we would like to admit it or not, I think the church is more culpable and a lot of what's going on than we'd like to admit. Because we can blame parents, we can blame school systems, we can blame politicians, but we're ignoring the one person that Jesus very clearly says, this is who I need you to make a disciple, or I need you to go make a disciple. And to even drive home the point further, we could ask a very difficult question that we might not want to hear, we might not even want to hear the question, let alone the answer. My question would be this, my friends, Are you personally leading anyone to Jesus right now? Or are you personally, by yourself, leading someone into a deeper relationship with the Lord? If the answer to either one of those questions is no, we're culpable for what's going on in our country. It's our fault for not doing what God's called us to do. Thirdly, after his confession, we see that he begins to get into the consequences of sin. Now, What is it that Israel is doing to cause such consequences to happen? Well, basically, there's about four things that Israel has done that's kind of um, broke the covenant. And we'll give these in no particular order. One, and we might say this is the worst of the four, but the first one is Israel has fallen in love with and engaged in child sacrifice. Well, what does that look like? Basically, they make these huge gods in the shape, they make... Scratch that. They make huge ovens in the shape of their gods. They put fire inside of this huge oven, and they take their living child, shovel men. And the purpose is, by killing our children, this God is going to do whatever we want. So we're sacrificing our children to make our life more convenient. It's pretty heinous. So child sacrifice. Secondly, um, they're exploiting their land without giving it rest. In fact, in the book of Chronicles, it says, the time frame of the exile will be enough time to make up for all the years of, uh, all the Sabbath years that you were to give your land. You've exploited your land, you've worked it too hard, you've stripped it bare, and this, you're going to be held accountable for it. Thirdly, they're having intense sexual perversions. Basically, if they can have sex with this person, they are. Well, what if 
Yes. Well, but what it, yes. They are oversexed, crazed perverts. And fourthly, they have engaged in worshiping every other god but the Lord. And we might say, well, that doesn't sound too bad compared to the other three. But the reality is the reason they're doing these three is because these other gods that they serve, they're, they're, they are living out how these gods live. Whatever we put as our number one priority will dictate how we live. So if we follow the Lord, probably we're going to live how the Lord has commanded us to live. If we substitute that with something else, that's going to affect how we live. And so they've engaged in violence, selfishness, um, perversion, idolatry. And at the end of it, the Lord says, enough. You guys have become too destructive and too evil. It's time. You've chosen to live like all the other nations. Ironically, I'm going to let you live among those other nations to see what that looks like. And as soon as they get there, they're like, we hate this. We don't understand. And that's typically how sin works. We want to do this because we don't truly realize how bad it is until we're in the middle of it. And we're like, yikes, I didn't realize. Now, we might say this seems unfair on God's part. Why would God do this? But we have to remember how the covenant works. In a covenant, we have a greater and a lesser who pledge themselves together. And the greater says, These, this is what I will do for you. This is what you will do for me. We're gonna, it's going to be a mutual relationship with one another. And if you break this, there are consequences to this. Israel could have said, we're out. We don't want this. This sounds too hard. This sounds too difficult. We don't want your relationship. Please send us back to Egypt. But instead, they say this, we want this, please make this happen, knowing full well the consequences of breaking a covenant. And they do. And the reality is, beyond breaking the covenant, the reality is that sin is far more destructive than we want to give it credit for. Um, This is a a quote from Dr. David Case, my college college theology professor in his book, What We Believe. Man calls sin an accident. God calls it an abomination. Man calls sin a blunder. God calls sin a blight. Man calls sin a chance event. God calls sin a choice. Man calls sin a defect. God calls sin a disease. Man calls sin an error. God calls sin enmity or hatred. Man calls sin a fascination. God calls it fatality. The reality of sin is not just that sin isn't just, well, this is what God wants me to do. This is what I want to do. Sin is far more disastrous than that. In fact, there's about four unintended consequences of sin. One, sin at its very core is selfish. This is what I want to do. I'm going to do it no matter what. I'm going to use who I want, when I want, where I want, and no one can stop me. That kind of selfishness is going to destroy a person's very soul. It's going to warp them so that they become completely self-focused. And we've all met people that are so self-focused, you don't even want anything to do with them. This person is only out for themselves. And if they, if they have people in their lives, they use them as obstacles or they use them as objects um, to be exploited and misused and abused. Or if they, don't, if they can't use that person, they use them as an obstacle to overcome or to get rid of. And so by thinking about reality that way, this is all about me, and I'm going to use people to get what I want. I'm going to get people out of my way in any way, shape, or form to get what I want. That destroys the very character and soul of a person. Secondly, as you can imagine, if a person has that kind of mentality, I'm just going to do whatever I want, it's going to destroy their relationships. It's going to wreak havoc on every relationship they have. Thirdly, it's going to destroy the relationship with God. As God speaks to them, they're going to have to ignore his voice more and more and more. Fun fact, when I was in the fifth grade, and maybe some of you can relate, relate to this, and this is one of those few times where I get, to get, I get to go into the old category. Do you guys remember the old, you people would pronounce it a radiator. In Indiana, we call them radiators. You guys remember the old radiator heaters that were like, a big box, and if you touched it, your arm would immediately boil off. It was so hot. You guys remember those? We had those in my elementary school. I went to a very old school. They actually closed it down a few years after I I was done, and they built a new. Anyway, we had those old radiator heaters, and you guys remember those. They would pop and hiss and crack, and it sounded like a small army was fighting in there. So anyway, in fifth grade, our music teacher was teaching us about this phenomenon where over time, you will begin to ignore things that you don't want to hear. And we're like, well, that's not true. And she said, how many of you guys have noticed the radiator in the class? And we're like, well, it it doesn't make any noise anymore. 
And she said, it's been making noise the whole time. And we all got quiet and we could hear it was super loud. It says that we had been so accustomed to ignoring it that we just got used to it. And maybe some of you, maybe you're sitting by a person that you have come to ignore because you don't want to hear what they have to say. It's called selective hearing. I don't want to hear what I need to do. I just want to hear it's time to eat. Anyway, maybe you can relate to that. That's how it is with the Lord. When a person ignores God's voice, it becomes harder and harder and harder for them to hear God to the point where they become hardened against him. And fourthly, and this is kind of something we don't talk about too much, and I'll just, I'll just put it in very frank terms, we don't want to be one of those liberal hippies hugging trees, but one of the realities is that sin will also destroy God's creation. Uh, we don't talk about that aspect very much, but there's actually a huge chunk of the Old Testament that tells us this is how we're to deal with God's creation. In fact, if you think of the first three commands of the Bible, be fruitful, multiply, deals with loving people. The third one, um, you got to be careful how I point these out. The third one, don't eat from that tree or love God and nothing else. The second command, rule over um, creation, and take care of it. We don't talk about that, but that is one of God's first three commands right off the bat. And so sin will cause destruction to God's creation. To put it in very practical terms, you know, when these huge safe riots are done, what does the landscape look like? They look like war zones because sin, if a if a person doesn't care about other people or God because of sin, they're definitely not going to care about stuff or bushes or trees or whatnot. And so sin destroys the person. It destroys the relationships with others. It destroys their relationship with God and prevents and works against them from having a relationship with God. And it destroys God's creation. And so Daniel tells us that based on all this understanding of sin, in God's righteousness, we see in verse 7, because of God's righteousness, he's going to hold sin accountable. And we would agree with that if we are talking about people. You know, How many of you guys get upset when a person commits a heinous crime and they're just allowed to get, get out of it? Oh, it's not a, you know, we, we maybe mishandled the evidence or maybe um, something wasn't known and they get to walk out for free. And it's just like, well, that doesn't seem like justice. If God allows sin to go unpunished, that would be unjust. That would be unfair that God is allowing wickedness and evil to happen, and he doesn't hold it accountable. So Daniel says, because God is just and righteous, he will hold sin accountable. He will punish it. Which brings us to our third point of Daniel's sermon, or Daniel's prayer, is he calls, he calls God to have mercy on his people. And it's interesting if you go to verse 16. In verse 7 he says, God, because you are righteous, you have declared judgment on Israel. But then notice in verse 16, he says, God, because you are righteous, come save us. And so for Daniel, Daniel's holding two ideas in tension. God is righteous and declares judgment and wrath on sin. But God is righteous and brings salvation to those who need it. Well, which one is it? And the answer is, yes, it's both. For Daniel, God's wrath and God's love aren't two opposite ideas in contradiction to each other. They're two sides of the same coin. And if you have kids, you understand this. I love my children very much. In fact, the other day, Evelyn's like, Dad, can we get donuts? It's like, yes. Which, basically, if, any, if a stranger came up to me and said, hey, I've got my own money for a donut. You want to go get uh, Yes, let's just go get it. I love donuts. Anyway, I love my kids very much. And you might even say, Jeff, you spoil those kids. And I would say that's probably true. That being said, if my kids do something wrong, they are in trouble. And Shelly sometimes says, Jeff, you go overboard with discipline, and that might be true. But if you ask, I love my kids, and part of loving your kids is when they do something wrong, you've got to correct them because in some cases, it's going to be extremely dangerous if I don't correct them. You know, if they run into the road without looking, that could be life-threatening. There needs to be discipline there to teach because I love. And so for Daniel, God's discipline, God's wrath, God's anger is not at odds at all. With his love, because if the people of Israel continue in this violence, this sexual perversion, this uh, destruction of their land, they're going to snuff themselves out of existence, which is what we saw in the story of Noah. And so he he pleads to God, God, in your righteousness, come rescue us. And he says, come rescue us for four reasons. One, he reminds him in verse 15 that you rescued our forefathers from Egypt. They were slaves there. The king wanted to destroy them. 
You came rescued them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. God, once again, we are caught in slavery. We've been slaves to the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Persians. And you could even argue that those aren't even the people, that's not even what's really got them captive in slavery. The real slave master that they've been serving aren't people, they've been slaves to sin. And that's the true rescue they need. And so he says, God, work righteously because we're being held captive against someone else. Come rescue us. Secondly, he says, God, come rescue us because the other nations are mocking you. So we've talked about this before, that God is going to reveal himself primarily through his people. That's why from the very beginning of the Bible, it says that we are made in the image of God, right? Because everywhere we go, we are to reflect God to all of creation. Unfortunately, with sin, we cease to show God's image in the way that he intended us to. But once we become Christians, God begins to work on our lives to transform us to be in his image again. He restores that image. And so as he restores that image, that is the primary tool that we show other people. How are people going to know that God is a loving God? Through me and you. How are people going to know that God is holy? Through me and you. And if God's people refuse to live that way, guess what that shows the world? That God's not really as loving as we thought he was, or God's not as holy as he was. And so Daniel says, God, the people look at us with scorn, and they, they're having, or they look at you with scorn because of how we've chosen to live. Come save us, transform us so that people can look at you how they should. Thirdly, he says that the people in Babylon have misunderstood the meaning of punishment. So for the people of Israel, they understand, well, we've broken the covenant, we've agreed to this, and this is exactly what we've asked for. But all these other nations, they don't understand that. Under, they don't have that view of punishment. So all they see is a God who's powerless against these other nations, and they've come in, basically beat our God up, and taken us captive. And it's a very interesting insight because one of the things that a lot of people have a hard time with with Christianity is the fact that God sends people to hell. How many of you guys have ever heard someone say something to that effect? You know, if God's such a loving God, why does he send people to hell? And that's kind of what Daniel's getting at, that because God has to take care of sin or punish sin, uh, show justice, that's going to be misconstrued by people who don't understand the Lord. And so basically he says, God, please rescue us because these other nations, they don't understand your punishment and they're looking negatively at you. Same thing could be said, God, since people, don't un since people have a poor view of you because of the concept of hell, God, transform lives so that they can know you deeper and come to understand how you work. Fourthly, Daniel says, God, come to our rescue because the consequences of our sin was more destructive than we could have thought. He says the temple's been destroyed, the, the city has been destroyed, the land of Israel has been destroyed, and the people have been destroyed. God, come clean up our mess. We can't do it ourselves. And so he's asking God, have mercy on us. We're, we're broken. We've been defeated. Come build us up. And the reality is, like I said earlier, Daniel is calling for the Lord to bring salvation to them and save them, not from the Medes or the Persians or even um, the Babylonians. They need save from themselves. They need save from sin. So what's God's answer to Daniel's prayer? I'll tell you next week. If you are, I was like, we, 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 let's break this into two weeks. It's going to be too long. The good news is you don't have to wait till next week to find out God's solution. Jesus is God's solution. That because of this slavery to sin that we have fallen into, God has sent his son Jesus to die for us, to set us free from its power, to give us victory over sin, and to draw us into relationship with him. Today, if you say, I have sin in my life and I feel powerless against it, Jesus has come to set you free from that sin. He has come to rescue you from that and to bring you into a relationship with the Lord. If you do not have a relationship with God, today is the day that you need to have one. Do not leave this sanctuary until you have said, Lord, I need you to set me free from sin and its power and transform my life. That being said, maybe some of us would say, okay, Jeff, well, we already knew that. Maybe the question that you and I have is this, Jeff, how in the world do we take that message to our culture? hopefully we all believe that Jesus died for our sins, and I hope that all of us here today have accepted that, and we've asked Jesus into our heart. But the question becomes for you and I, how do we take that message of salvation to our world? Well, I think we can look at how Daniel 
is introduced in this passage. That there are four primary things that Daniel does. And I would suggest that if the church does these four things, we're going to see God's message spread across our land. And I always ask this every week and almost every hand goes up. How many of you guys would say we need the Lord to move across our land? Absolutely. Daniel's going to, tell, Daniel's going to be an example of four things we can do. The first thing, notice what Daniel starts off doing in this passage. He is committed to reading God's word. Step one, if you want something to happen in our culture, in our country, in our state, in our city, the first step is you must be committed to God's word. Well, what does that mean? We need to be steeped in God's word. We need to be reading his word. Well, do you mean we need to get a little devotional book that has one little verse in it and two pages of some lady's cutesy, pootsy little thoughts? No. That's not reading God's Word. That's called the devotional. That's not God's Word. We need to be steeped in God's Word. I've been in ministry for almost 20 years now, and the one thing I always hear is that people have this ignorance of Scripture, that you try to talk to them about passages, and it's like you're speaking a different language. We must be steeped in God's Word. This is going to tell us who God is and what He's done and how we've been called to live. How do we have successful lives that reflect God's kingdom in this world? We need to read His Word. We need to be steeped in it. And, you know, maybe I'll say this, maybe this will get me in trouble, maybe it won't, who knows. You know, Randy always asks me, you know, I don't know if you ever asked it this way, I'll just ask it, he's looking at me. You know, how do we get in these situations? And I think the reality is a lot of times, a lot of pastors just, they preach nonsense. They, they come up here and it's like, I'm going to ramble for 30 minutes about something that might have nothing to do with this text. You know, here's five ways we can be like a cow. What? And this, this is a real sermon title. Well, not that one. That one I made up because I was being facetious. Five ways to be like an NFL quarterback. How about five ways to be like Jesus? That's what we've been called to do. We need to be steeped in God's word. We need to know what his word says. And it's interesting, when you go back to read about King Josiah, they lose the book of Deuteronomy. How do you lose a book of the Bible? What do they do? It gets somehow built into a wall in the temple and King, they find it when they're rebuilding, and they bring it to Josiah, and he begins to read God's word, and he says, we failed. We've done something wrong. We need to get right with the Lord. That's kind of what happens here with Daniel. He begins to read God's word, and it convicts him. He says, we need to get right with the Lord. So one, we must be committed to God's word. Secondly, we must be people committed to prayer. Daniel immediately goes and prays for his country, his people, for God to come and rescue him. If we want to see a true change, we must be people of prayer. We must seek God's face. We have to confess our sin, the sin of God's people, the sin of our country, the sin of our... We need to go to God and petition to God on behalf of the world and ask God to do something mighty and miraculous. Three, and I know this is kind of weird, and whenever I bring this up, people say, well, we're not Catholic, but... We see in Daniel that in order for true transformation to happen, there must be confession. Sin is not a private thing. You cannot privately sin because the effects of sin are going to spread into all your relationships. And so confession needs to be something that God's people do. Now, you don't have to stand up in front of the church. Like Ruth doesn't have to stand up and say, you know, yesterday I stole 50 pounds of candy from Turkey Hill. That might be awkward, Ruth. Don't do that. I don't think she did that. She shook her head no. So Ruth didn't do it. Okay. One day I said something like that, and then afterwards I was like, that person may do stuff like that. So that's why I picked Ruth, because I don't think she would steal. But we need to confess sin. Well, what are the benefits of confessing sin? Well, if I know I'm going to confess my sin, guess what I'm going to be more apt not to do? I don't want to have to tell Ellie I sinned this week, so I'm just not going to sin. I'm going to save myself that humiliation. But it also helps us, if we do struggle with sin, to tell somebody to hold us accountable. Just to, Ellie might come up and say, Jeff, I know you were struggling with this three weeks ago. How's it going? Ellie, I know you've been praying for me. Thank you. I've not been struggling with that sin. There's help in sin. And also the Lord tells us we have to confess our sin. And fourthly, we are called to turn to God for our salvation. Daniel doesn't turn to Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't turn to Darius. He's not going to turn to Cyrus in the next couple chapters. He always turns to the Lord and says, God, you and you alone can rescue us. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means as God's people, the only one who can change anything is the Lord. So when we begin to say, what steps can save our country? It's going to be God. It's not going to be families. It's not going to be the school system. It's not going to be 
um, our government. It's going to be the Lord maybe working through those, but it's going to be God and God alone. And for some reason, God loves to work through his people, the church. If we want to see something truly happen, it's going to have to come from God working through us as we begin to minister to people. As we are committed to God's word, as we're committed to prayer, as we're committed to confessing sin and hopefully being set free from sin and looking to the Lord as our salvation. So with that, next week we're going to come back to chapter 9 and see how the Lord responds. But I think today um, what, I, what we primarily want to look at is that God is the one who's in control. He is the one who can set people free from sin and rescue people. So with that, let's close in prayer. And um, just allow the Lord to continue to minister to your heart and um, wrestle through Daniel. Daniel chapter, first half of Daniel is kind of fun. We get to read all these fun stories we loved as kids. Second half of Daniel, he starts punching us a little bit, doesn't he? And Daniel 9, he's like, ah, we'll just take off the gloves. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that you have set us free from the power of sin. And Lord, I feel that in many ways, Daniel chapter 9 is exactly where we are. How long is this nonsense going to last in our culture where lies are proclaimed as if they were truth? Truth, are called, truth is called lies. Being violent in the streets is called good. But doing things like worshiping the Lord is called evil. God, this is such a crazy time. And God, what is our responsibility? Our responsibility is we must be people committed to your word. So God, help us to fall deeply in love with your word and its transforming power. Help us to be people of prayer that, God, we would be in constant relationship with you, speaking to you and allowing you to speak to us. Help us to be people who confess sin. Help us to confess our own sins, the sins of our church. And God, help us to confess the sin of our country. As the saying goes, we're all in the same boat. And Lord, most of all, let us turn to you. God, listening to these politicians, they keep saying, you know, vote for me and things are going to change. But Lord, the reality is very little will change. The only one who can truly transform people where it matters the most in the heart is you. So God, let us be people that turn to you. And God, help us to turn away from the power of sin in our lives. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You're dismissed. Thank you.